Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys. Section 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys, A Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites, by Amelia B. Edwards. Chapter 4. At Cortina, Part 3. Next morning we ordered the Caretta to take us to Falls Garego. It would be difficult, perhaps, to say why, but we were longing to see the Marmolata, and could not rest till we had achieved, at least, a distant glimpse of him. In the first place it is supposed to be the highest of all the Dolomites. In the second its snow-fields and glaciers are more extensive than those of any of its neighbors, and in the third place it is so hemmed in on all sides by other mountains, that it is very difficult to obtain a view of it at all. The morning was somewhat doubtful. The Tofana had, on its helmet of cloud, and though the sun shone brilliantly at times, there was an unsettled, uncertain look about the rolling cumuli that kept us hesitating till nearly eleven a.m. Then old Gadina pronounced in favor of the weather, and we resolved to venture. I shall not soon forget our dismay at first sight of the Caretta. It was simply a wooden trough on four wheels, some seven feet in length by three and a half in breadth, with a crosswise plank to sit upon. The horse, a magnificent light chestnut full seventeen hands high, with a huge leather collar like an Elizabethan ruff, towered above the vehicle, and a boy sat on the shafts to drive. Springs, of course, there were none, cushions there were none, but mats and rugs were piled in abundantly, and so we started. Our way lay over the bridge, and up past the cross where we had rested and sketched a day or two before. Again the great view over the valley became unrolled like a scroll beneath our feet. Again the Cristallo, the Crota Malcora, Sorapis, and Antileo seemed to rise as we rose, and the Tofana loomed nearer and more threatening with every step of our progress. Now, mounting ever higher among green slopes gorgeous with wild flowers, and through pine woods all abloom with strawberry blossoms, we left the Cortina view behind, and passed close under the southwest face of the Tofana, so close that we could distinctly see the mouth of a famous cavern, which is said to penetrate for many hundred feet into the heart of the mountain. Seen from the Tresassi road, it looks perfectly inaccessible a mere rabbit-hole in the face of a vertical and triangular precipice, like the entrance to the Great Pyramid. This cavern, however, is one of the sites of Cortina, and can be reached without difficulty when there is an accumulation of snow upon the slopes beneath. And now, as we mount higher, rounding the last buttresses of the Tofana, and coming in sight of the first outlying ridge of Monte Lagazui, we begin to meet frequent groups of peasants, some two and three, some twelve or fifteen strong, some carrying huge loads of homespun frieze and linen on their backs, some laden with wooden ware, some with live poultry, all in their holiday clothes, and all bound for the great sagro. They are of all ages, and apparently of all grades, old folks and young, farmers and farm servants, a stumpy, sturdy, fresh-colored, honest-looking race, the women with legs like pillars, and the men averaging from five foot five to five foot seven in height. The old men wear knee breeches and comical little frieze coats, very short and full in the skirts, with two large buttons set high up in the middle of their backs, like a pair of eyes. The young fellows affect trousers and embroidered braces, and carry little bundles of colored feathers and artificial flowers in their hats. The costumes of the girls, however, are quite overwhelming and unlike anything that we have yet seen. They wear hats like the men, and, adorned in the same manner, dark green, blue, or brown skirts laid in close folds like the plating of a kilt, and starting from just between the shoulders, like a sack, bodices open in front and laced with purple braid, sleeves tight to the arm and wrist, but slashed at the top with a puffing of white linen, and round their necks bright scarlet and yellow handkerchiefs of printed cotton. What people are these? we asked, as the first of many such apparitions appears before us at a turn of the road. To which the boy on the shafts, a laughing, merry fellow named Giovanni, replies that these are contadini from Buchenstein, 
Luvina Lungo, and Carfora. "'But Corfara is a long way off,' exclaims L., who is better up in her maps than myself, and knows something of the distances. "'Eh, some of them come forty, fifty, sixty miles over the mountains. Some walk all night, both coming and going. Echo!' with a critical glance at the pillars before mentioned. What are the miles to a donzella like that? Meanwhile we are suffering agonies of dislocation, for the road, which is only just wide enough for our wheels, and overhangs a precipice at the bottom of which foams a roaring torrent, is full of loose stones, over which the caretta jolts and blunders, creaks, leaps, and rolls, in such a distracting manner that we are fain at last to get out and walk. The glen grows narrower, and the castellated rocks which we had already observed from Cortina are seen high above sloping woods on the opposite bank of the stream. Giovanni, who knows everything, informs us that they are here called the Torret, and form part of the crest of Monte Nuvolu, and that the torrent which takes its rise somewhere among the fastnesses of the Lagazui is known as the Costina. More and more pedestrians, meanwhile, keep trooping past. The farther we go, the thicker they come. Where will they all sleep to-night? The Aquila Nera and the Stella d'Oro, where they each four times their present size, would not hold more than half of them, and yet this is only one road out of many. At this moment they are tramping into Cortino from Aranzo, from Pieve de Cadore, and from all the villages of the Ampezzo Thal. There will be fifteen hundred strangers, says our driver, in Cortina to-night. And now, quite suddenly, we come upon a better-dressed group than any we have yet met. Two tall, gentlemanly-looking young men and a lady, followed by a countryman with their luggage on his back. The lady is young and pretty, with a rose in her black hair and no bonnet. The young men lift their hats as they pass. The countryman, plodding after them, looks up with a somewhat knowing expression and touches his cap. But what is he carrying on his back? Not their luggage, after all. A side-saddle, a large, new, London-made side-saddle with a third pommel to screw and a velvet-lined stirrup dangling down behind it. It was our own messenger. It was Madame Pezzi's saddle. Hearing a duet of joyful exclamations in the rear, the young lady turned round, smiling. The young men came forward, smiling also. They were Madame Pezzi's two sons. Lieutenant Cesare Pezzi, an ex-Garibaldian officer, and young Agostino Pezzi, who, with his mother, keeps the inn at Capriel. The damsel with the rose in her hair was Agostino's wife. They had come over the pass on foot, and were bound, like every one else, for the Segro at Cortina. Concluding, of course, that we were on our way to Capriel, their surprise was great that we should have left Cortina without waiting for the festival. But they were still more astonished on finding that we had come up all this way only to peep at the Marmolata, and go back again. "'Shall we get a good view?' I asked, somewhat anxiously, for the clouds had been gathering gloomily during the last half-hour. They shook their heads and looked doubtful. The mists were thickening fast, they said, on the other side. We must push on at once for the top, and delay for nothing at the hospice. The mountain was quite clear half an hour ago, but soon there would be nothing of it visible. This opinion brought our interview to an abrupt conclusion, and with the promise of meeting again to-morrow sent us hurrying away towards the hospice, a small white cottage by the roadside, about a quarter of a mile ahead. Here we left the caretta, bade Giovanni attend to the comforts of his horse, and hastened on alone towards the top. We had but to follow the road which swept round and across a wild slope of barren moor bounded by the crags of Lagazui on the one hand, and by the low-lying ridge of Monte Nuvalu on the other. Tall posts, each the stem of a stout fir-tree, were here set at regular intervals along the side of the path, like telegraph posts, to mark the course of the road, a necessary precaution at this height, 7,073 feet, where the snow lies deep for eight months out of every twelve. Even now, on the 6th of July, every rift and hollow held its yet unmelted snowdrift. And now a rough wayside cross comes into sight a few yards farther ahead. A swift runner overtakes us, and Giovanni, breathless and flushed, exclaims, Ecco, signora, ecco la croce, di la... Vedremo la marmalata. 
See, si, signore, yonder is the cross. From there we shall see the marmolata. And from there, by rare good fortune, we do see it, a huge, roof-shaped mass, sloping and smooth, and snowy white against a leaden sky. For vastness of expression and extent of snow, as seen from this side, it recalls Mont Blanc. Distance, instead of diminishing its bulk, seems by contrast with surrounding heights to enhance it. The two valleys of Andres and Luvinalongo, the Monte Padon and a whole sea of minor peaks, occupy the intervening space, and yet the Marmolata seems to fill the scene. But only for a few seconds. Even as we stand there, eagerly gazing at it, the summit becomes dimmed. The outline fades. A pale gray tint spreads over the snowfields, and there remains only a blurred, gigantic, indefinite something, scarcely to be distinguished from the mist by which it is surrounded. The avolo of a marmolata, exclaims Giovanni. The signoras were only just in time, but they have seen him pulito. Now this word pulito, clean, in one sense or another, is always on the tip of Giovanni's tongue, and, as I soon afterwards find, is used indiscriminately for clear, brilliant, successful, intelligible, and a dozen other meanings throughout this part of the Tyrol. Your mule goes pulito. Your new boots fit you pulito. Your field glass shows objects pulito. You achieve a creditable bit of climbing, and are complimented on having done it pulito. Your driver was drunk last evening, but you are assured that he is pulito, in the sense of sober, this morning. It is, in short, a word of most elastic capabilities, but somewhat puzzling to strangers for that reason. The marmolata having retired from the scene, we now turn back, taking a short cut across the dreary cull, and finding by the way some exquisite specimens of wild Daphne, Daphne sonorum, abundance of the small mountain gentian, gentiana verna, and large clusters of a very lovely, tiny pink flower with wax-like petals, minute and close as a lichen, and unlike anything that either of us has ever seen before. Arrived at the hospice, and being by this time very hungry, we go in and are welcomed by a clean, smiling padrona who, because her one public room is full of peasants eating, drinking, and smoking, invites us into the kitchen, a model kitchen like a kitchen in a Dutch picture, with a floor of bright red bricks and a roaring wood fire and rows upon rows of brass and copper pans shining like mirrors. She proves to be richer, however, in cooking utensils than in provisions, for dry bread, eggs, butter, and a coarse, uneatable mountain cheese are all she has to offer. Still, with eggs and butter, one is not obliged to starve. The writer, in a moment of happy inspiration, undertakes the part of cook, and offers to concoct a certain dish known as buttered eggs, or, more politely, as hasty omelette. So an apron is borrowed, and, to the unbounded entertainment of the landlady and her servant, the savory mess is prepared in a few minutes. From that moment I am known at Falzarego as the Signora Cuoca, the Signora Cook, am greeted by that title the next time I appear at the hospice, and am remembered by it, doubtless, to this day. By the time we are again ready to start, the mists have rolled up to the top of the pass, and the sky all round looks black and threatening. Some peasants outside predict a storm, and counsel us to get down into the valley as quickly as may be. So the chestnut is hastily put to, and we rattle off just as the first heavy drops come splashing down to a low accompaniment of very distant thunder. The storm, however, if there was a storm, remained locked in on the other side of the pass. We soon left it behind, and long before we reached the point leading to the Crepa de Velvedere, the sun was shining brilliantly. End of section 9《Trodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys》Part 10 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys A Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites by Amelia B. Edwards. Chapter 5 Cortina to Pieve di Cadore, Part 1 the morning of the sagro dawned to a prodigious ringing of church bells and firing of musketry. There were masses going on in both churches from five a.m. till midday. 
The long street and the piazza by the post office presented one uninterrupted line of booths. There were hundreds of strangers all over the town, hundreds in the churches. Every house seemed to have suddenly become an albergo. Every window, every balcony, every doorway was crowded. The acrobats paraded Cortina again this brilliant Sunday morning about nine o'clock and the discord of their drums and trumpets went on all day long, to the accompaniment of the church bells and the intermittent firing of the sharpshooters down at the tier by the riverside. What a motley crowd! What a busy, cheerful scene! What a confusion of voices, languages, music, bells, and gunpowder! Here are Austrian Tyrolese from Talbach, Inichin, and the Sexton Thal, who speak only German, Italian Tyrolese from the Longarone side, who speak only Italian, others from the border villages who speak both, or a patois compounded of both, which is quite unintelligible. The costumes of these mountain folk are still more various than their tongues. The women of San Vito wear breastplates of crimson or green satin, banded with broad gold braid, and ornamented with spangles. The women of the Pusther Thal walk about in huge, turban-like headdresses, as becoming and quite as heavy as the bearskins of the grenadiers. The men of Flisht are lost in their enormous black boots, modeled apparently on those of the French position of the last century. Here, too, are old women in homemade otter-skinned hats, high in the crown and ornamented like a footman's with a broad gold band, and bold Jaegers with wide leather belts, green braces, steeple-crowned hats and guns slung across their shoulders, looking exactly like Caspar in Der Freischutz. The wonderful damsels of Lavina Lungo, whom we met yesterday on the pass, are also present in great force, but the prevailing costume is of course that of the Ampezzo. It consists of a black felt hat with a bunch of feathers at the side, a black cloth skirt and bodice trimmed with black velvet or black satin loose white sleeves, a large blue apron that almost meets behind, and a little colored handkerchief around the neck. Simple, sober, and becoming, this dress suits young and old alike, and the round hat sets off a pretty face very agreeably. Learning that the musical mass was to begin at eleven a.m., we took care, as we thought, to be at the church doors in good time, but at a quarter before the hour found the steps crowded outside and barely standing room within. The whole body of the church was one mass of life, color, bare heads, and upturned faces. Men and women alike held their hats in their hands. Three priests at three different altars performed mass simultaneously. The organist played his best, assisted, however, by the Cortina brass band with an effect that was almost maddening. One trombone player, in particular, an apoplectic, red-faced man in gray flannel shirt-sleeves, blew as if bent on blowing his brains out. Now and then, however, when the organist had an unaccompanied interlude, or the choir-master a few phrases of solo, there came a lucid interval when one breathed again. But these respites were few and brief, and except during the sermon the brass band that morning had quite the best of it. The old curé preached, attired in magnificent vestments of white and gold brocade. His sermon turned upon faith, and he illustrated his text oddly enough by references to all kinds of matters, in which faith is not generally supposed to bear a leading part. The soldier, the artist, the lawyer, the man of science, what could they do, he asked, without faith? Take the soldier, for instance, what is it that inspires him with courage to face the cannon's mouth? Faith. Take the painter. Judge what must have inspired the frescoes and paintings in this very church faith. Think of the patience and labor required in cutting of the Suez Canal. What supported those workmen through their trying task? Faith. Look again at the Mont Sensis Tunnel. Think of how those engineers began at opposite sides of that great mountain, and, at length, after years of labor, met in the midst of it. To what power must we attribute such perseverance crowned with such success? To the supreme and vivifying power of faith." Of such quality was the good man's discourse. He preached in Italian, and paused after every peroration to mop his bald head with a blue cotton pocket handkerchief. It was a hot day, and his eloquence quite exhausted him. Coming out of the church, we take a turn round the fair. 
Here are booths for the sale of everything under the sun, of hats, umbrellas, pipes, spectacles, pots, pans, and kettles, tanned leather, untanned leather, baskets, wooden ladles, boots and shoes, blankets, homespun frieze and linen, harness, scythes, tinwares, woodenwares, nails, screws, and carpenter's tools, knives, forks, and spoons, crockery, toys, crucifixes and prayer books, braces, garters, pocket books, steel chains, sleeve buttons and stationery, live poultry, fruit, vegetables, cheap jewelry, ribbons, stuffs, seeds, bird cages, and cotton umbrellas of many colors. Here, too, is a stall for the exclusive sale of watches, from the massive silver turnip to the little flat Geneva timekeeper of the size, and probably also of the value, of an English florin. Near the church door stands a somewhat superior booth, stocked with medieval brasswork, altar candlesticks, patinas, chalices, and the like, while, next in rotation, a grave-looking old peasant presides over a big barrel full of straw and water, round the top of which, in symmetrical array, repose wet stones of all sizes. It is remarkable that there are here no dancing or refreshment booths. The sober Tyrolese do not often dance, unless at weddings, and for meals those who have not brought food with them crowd at midday into the inns and private houses, and there eat with small appearance of festivity. Even the acrobats do not seem greatly to attract them. A large crowd gathers outside the show and almost fills the piazza in the afternoon, but not many seem to be going in. They are content, for the most part, to listen to the comic dialogue sustained on the outer platform by the clown and Mary Andrew, and prefer to keep their soldi warm in their pockets. Now the writer, knowing from previous experience the unpopularity of the sketcher, steals into corners and behind booths, in order to secure a few notes of costume and character, but, being speedily found out and surrounded, is fain either to use her pencil openly or not at all. The good people of Ampezzo, however, prove to be less sensitive in this manner than the peasants of Italy or Switzerland. They are delighted to be sketched, and come round by dozens, begging to have their portraits taken, and anxious that no detail of costume should be omitted. One very handsome woman of Lavina Lungo, tempted by the promise of a florin, came home with me in order that I might make a careful, colored study of her costume. She was tall, and so finely formed, that not even that hideous sack and shapeless bodice could disguise the perfection of her figure. As I placed her, so she stood, silent, motionless, absorbed, for more than half an hour. A more majestic face I never saw nor one so full of a sweet, impenetrable melancholy. Being questioned, she said she was twenty-three years of age, and a farm-servant at Lavinalungo. "'And you are not married?' I asked. "'No, signora. Nor betrothed? No, signora. But that must be your own fault,' I said. She shook her head. "'Ah, no,' she replied, with a slightly heightened color. "'Our young men do not marry without money. Who would think of me? I am too poor.' I should have liked to know more of her history, but her natural dignity and reserve were such that I felt I must not question her farther. The sketch finished, she just glanced at it, put back the proffered payment, and turned at once to go. The signora was very welcome, she said. She did not wish to be paid. Being pressed, however, to take the money, she yielded, more, as it seemed, through good breeding than from inclination, and so went away, taking the downward path from the back of the house, and going home over the mountain alone. That afternoon Santo Siorpas came again, bringing with him a tall, brown, fair-haired young man of about twenty-eight or thirty, whom he introduced as Signor Giuseppe Gerina. This Giuseppe, he said, was a farmer, lately married, well-to-do, and a nephew of our landlord at the Aquila Nera. Not being a professional guide, he would nevertheless be happy to travel with the signoras, and to be useful to the utmost of his power. He did not profess to know all the country laid down in our scheme, but he would take Santo's written instructions as to routes, inns, mules, guides, and so forth, and he, Santo, did not doubt that we should find Giuseppe in all respects as well fitted for the work as himself. 
Now Giuseppe's manner and appearance were particularly prepossessing. We liked his simple gravity, the intelligence with which he asked and answered questions, and the interest with which he examined our maps and guidebooks. Preliminaries, therefore, were soon settled. He was to inform himself thoroughly upon all matters connected with the route, and to hold himself in readiness to join us in a day or two. Meanwhile it was agreed that we should pay him at the same rate that we should have paid Santos Siorpas, namely, two and a half florins a day for his wages, and one florin and a half for his food, in all about eight francs, or six and eight pence English, per diem. If at any time we were to travel by any public conveyance, we were of course to pay his fare, but all lodging and other expenses en route were to be defrayed by himself. It may be here observed, once and for always, that a more fortunate choice could not have been made. Faithful, honest, courteous, untiring, intelligent, Giuseppe Guerina, unused as he was to his new office, entered upon his duties as one to the manner born, and left nothing to be desired. Always at hand, but never obtrusive, as economical of our money as he was of his own, he was always thinking for us and never for himself. And so anxious was he that the signoras should see all that was to be seen, that, when travelling through a district new to himself, he used to take pains each evening to enter in his pocket-book all such details as he could pick up, in advance, respecting every object of interest which might chance to lie in our way in the course of the next day's journey. He remained with us, as will be seen, throughout this Dolomite tour, and we parted with mutual regret when it ended. Numbers of those who had thronged the fair and the churches all this day went home the same afternoon or evening. As long as daylight remained they could be seen dotting every mountain path, and for hours after all Cortina was in bed, their long, wild, alpine cry rang from hillside to hillside and broke the silence of the night. End of section 10「Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys」Section 11 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys A Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites by Amelia B. Edwards Chapter 5 Cortina to Piev de Cadore Part 2 Next morning, however, there seemed to be as many as ever in the fair, which was kept up throughout the second day with undiminished spirit. This second morning began with a wedding. The order of the bridal procession was as follows. First came the indefatigable brass band, numbering some twenty performers, then the bride and the best man, then the bride's father and mother, then the bridegroom walking alone, and lastly some fourteen or fifteen friends and relations of both sexes. In this order they twice paraded the whole length of the town. The bride wore a black alpaca dress, the usual black cloth bodice and white sleeves, and a gorgeous apron of red and green silk fastened behind with a pair of quaint brass clasps. Neither she nor any of the other women on this occasion wore hats, but only an abundance of silver pins in their neatly plaited hair. Having entered the church, they all took seats in the aisle about halfway down, and the band went into the organ loft. Presently the bridegroom went up by himself to the altar, and kneeled down. When he had knelt there a few minutes, the mother of the bride led her daughter up, placed her at his left hand, and there left her. After they had both knelt there some five minutes longer, the priest came in, followed by the old bell-ringer who acted as clerk. The bell-ringer then lighted a pair of long wax tapers and handed them to the priest, who blessed them and gave one to the bride and the other to the bridegroom. This was the beginning of the ceremony. Then the priest read the marriage service in a low voice and very quickly, only pausing presently to ask for the rings, which were handed to him on a little glass dish by the bell-ringer. The priest, having blessed the rings, first gave one to the bridegroom to place upon the finger of the bride and then gave the other to the bride to place upon the finger of the bridegroom. During all this time they never parted from their tapers, but shifted them from one hand to the other as occasion required. At this stage of the ceremony the bridegroom produced some money, and gave it to the bride. 
They were then profusely sprinkled with holy water, and this concluded the marriage service. High mass was next performed, as yesterday, with the full band and organ, the newly married couple remaining the whole time upon their knees before the altar, with their lighted tapers in their hands. At length, when all was over, and the congregation was about to disperse, the bridegroom got up coolly and walked out of the church, leaving his bride still kneeling. Then her mother came up, again, and led her away. The bridegroom, without so much as looking back to see what had become of her, went and played at bowls in the piazza. The bride went home with her parents, took off her finery, and shortly reappeared in her shabby everyday clothes. It is, perhaps, Tyrolean etiquette for newly married persons to avoid each other as much as possible. At all events the bridegroom loafed about with the men, and the bride walked with her own people, and they were not once seen together all the rest of the day. One of the pleasantest excursions that we made at this time was to the Landro in the Holstentin Thal, about twelve miles from Cortina by the Austrian post road. On this occasion our landlord provided a comfortable little chaise on good springs, with a seat in front for the driver, and the chestnut appeared in smart harness, with red tassels on his head, and a necklace of little jingling bells. With Giovanni again to drive, we started early one lovely July morning, following the course of the upper Ampezzo Valley, skirting all the lengths of the Tofana, and seeing again its three summits in succession. Being so long in the ridge, the great height and size of this mountain can only be appreciated by those who see it from at least two sides of its vast triangle, from the Tresassi Pass on the southwest, and from the high road on the east. Good walkers with time to spare may complete the tour of the mountain by ascending the Val Travernanza, which divides the Tofana Ridge from that of the Monte Lagazui. The pyramidal peak on the side of the Tre Sassi has been repeatedly ascended by hunters from Cortina. The central peak was achieved by Dr. Groman in 1863, and the north peak was reached in 1869 by Mr. Bonney, who describes the view looking over in the direction of Bruneck and the Grosse Venediger as one of the finest among the eastern Alps. The highest peak, according to the latest measurements, reaches as nearly as possible to 10,724 feet. From Cortina the road runs for some distance at a level of about 60 feet above the bed of the Boita, and passes presently under the shadow of a kind of barber's pole painted with red and white stripes, which here juts across the road at an angle of 45 degrees. As we prepare to drive under it, the door of a little hut adjoining, which we had taken till now for a good-sized kennel, flies suddenly open, and a small, withered, excited old man flings himself into the middle of the road, and demands forty-eight kreutzers for toll. Becoming learned in the ways of the place, we soon know that a white and red pole always stands for a toll-bar, while a black and yellow one indicates the boundary line between Austria and Italy. From here the road now begins to ascend, and the mountains to close in. New peaks, snow-streaked above and wooded below, come into view, and the great crag of Putelstein, once crowned by a famous medieval stronghold, shuts in the end of the valley. The old castle was leveled to the ground in 1867, and there is some talk of a modern fortress to be erected on its site. At this point the road swings round abruptly to the right, winds up through the pine woods behind the platform on which the castle used to stand, leaves the noisy torrent far below, and, trending eastward at right angles to the Ampezzo Valley, takes, in local parlance, the name of the Thal Tedesco, which, however, is not to be found in either Mayer's or Arteria's maps. Here also a board by the wayside informs us that we have entered the Distretta of Velsberg. And now the road leads through a succession of delicious grassy glades, among pine woods loaded with crimson and violet cones, and festooned with the weird gray beard moss of the upper Alps. Wild campanulas and purple gentians, deep golden arnica blossoms, pink daphne, and a whole world of other wild flowers, some quite new to us, here bloom in such abundance that the space of green sward on either side of the carriageway looks as if bordered by a strip of Persian carpet. Meanwhile, through openings in the wood, we catch occasional glimpses of great dolomite peaks to right and left and, emerging by and by upon an open space of meadowland on the borders of which stands a tiny farmhouse, we see the fine pinnacles of the Cristalino, 
9,238 feet, rising in giant battlements beyond the sloping ground upon our right. And now the road crosses a rough torrent bed, stony and steep, and blinding white in the sunshine. Here we alight and make our way across from boulder to boulder, while Giovanni leads the chestnut in and out among the shallows. And now as we emerge from the pine woods, a new dolomite, a huge, dark, mournful-looking mountain, ominously splashed with deep red stains, rises suddenly into towering prominence upon our left, and seems almost to overhang the road. What mountain is this? For once Giovanni is at fault. He thinks it must be the Croda Rossa, but he is not sure. Finding a mountain, however, here set down in Mare's map as the Crepa Rosa, and in Artaria as the Rothwand, we are fain to conclude that it is in each case the same, with only a difference in the name. Unlike all other Dolomites that we have yet seen, the Croda Rossa, instead of being grey and pallid, is of a gloomy brownish and purplish hue, like the mountain known as Black Stairs, near Enniscorthy in Ireland. Going on in the direction of Sludervak, and looking back upon the Crota Rossa, it constantly assumes a more and more threatening aspect, rising cliff above cliff towards one vast domed summit, just under which is gathered a cluster of small peaks quite steeped in blood color. From these great streaks and splashes of the same hue stream down the barren precipices below, as if some great slaughter had been done there in the old days of the world. Passing Schluterbach, a clean-looking roadside inn, we come presently in sight of the Duran Sea, a lovely little emerald-green lake streaked with violet shadows and measuring about three-quarters of a mile in length. Great mountains close it in on all sides, and the rich woods of the lower hills slope down to the water's edge. The clustered peaks, the eternal snows, and glaciers of Monte Cristallo, the towering summit of the Piz Popina, and the extraordinary towers of the Drezinen come one after the other into view. As for the Drezinen, they surpass in boldness and weirdness all the Dolomites of the Ampezzo. Seen through an opening between two wooded hills, they rise abruptly from behind the intervening plateau of Monte Piano, as if thrust up from the center of the earth like a pair of tusks. No mere description can convey to even the most apprehensive reader any correct impression of their outline, their look of intense energy, of upwardness, of bristling, irresistible force. Two barren, isolated obelisks of pale, sulfurish, orange-streaked limestone, all shivered into keen scimitar blades and shark-like teeth towards the summit, they almost defy the pencil and quite defy the pen. For the annexed illustration, however, so far as mere truthfulness of actual form goes, the writer can vouch, having sketched it very carefully from the best point along the borders of the lake. At Landro, a clean and comfortable inn standing alone at the head of the lake, we stayed to feed the horse and take luncheon. Here we were served with excellent cold salmon from the Miserina Lake, and hot cutlets. Everything about the place looked promising. The landlord and landlady and their son, a bright lad of about seventeen, spoke only an unintelligible kind of German, but were cheerfully disposed and most obliging. Thinking that it might be a pleasant place to put up at for a few days, we inquired about rooms, but every inch of the house was occupied for the whole summer by a large party, chiefly English, including a member of the Italian club Alpino. This gentleman, followed by a gigantic St. Bernard dog, came in while we were at luncheon, marvelously attired in a brilliant scarlet flannel blouse and high black riding boots, in which costume, followed always by his dog, he had that morning been up a difficult ice slope of Monte Cristallo. Luncheon over, we strolled and sketched a while beside the fairy waters of the Duran Sea, a lake into which three torrents flow, and from which no stream issues. Why it never overflows its banks, and where the surplus water vanishes to, are mysteries for which no one has yet accounted. There has been talk of hidden clefts and natural emissaries in the bed of the lake, but it is obviously unlikely, to say the least of it, that the supply and the drainage should be adjusted with such nicety. Why, therefore, the Duran Sea is always full, and never too full, remains to be explained by men of science." 
Of the three great mountains seen from Landro, it may be as well to mention that the Drezinen, 9,833 feet, has been lately ascended by members of the Austrian or German Alpine clubs, that the Piz Popina, 10,389 feet, was first achieved by Mr. E. R. Whitwell, and that the highest peak of Monte Cristallo, 10,644 feet, was gained by Dr. Groman in September 1865, from the Cristal Pass, beginning on the side of the Tre Croce. Starting from the Duran Sea, the road again turns northward, and so runs nearly straight all the way to Toblach, a distance of about ten more English miles. Looking up the vista of this narrow glen from Landro, one sees the snow-capped mountains of the Pusther Thal closing in the view. Returning to Cortina in the pleasant afternoon, we left the carriage at a point not far from the toll-bar, and strolled homewards by a lower path leading through fields and meadows, and past the ruins of a curious old turreted chateau, one tower of which now serves for the spire of a little church, built with the stones of the former stronghold. End of section 11broadened peaks and unfrequented valleys section twelve this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org untrodden peaks and unfrequented valleys a midsummer ramble through the dolomites by amelia b edwards chapter five cortina to pieve de cadore part three meanwhile there yet remained much to be seen and done before we could leave cortina we must see the Marmarole, hitherto completely hidden behind the Crota Malcora, and the Misurina Lake, famous for its otters and its salmon trout. We must go over the Tre Croce Pass, and, and up the Val d'Aranzo, and above all we must visit Titian's birthplace at Pieve de Cadore. Now it seemed, so far as one could judge from maps, to be quite possible to bring all these points into a single excursion taking each in its order, and passing a night or two on the road. In order to do this, we must follow the Ampezzo Valley to Pieve de Cadore, then take the valley of the Piave as far as its junction with the Anzie at Treponti, and thence branch off into the Val d'Aranzo, and from Aranzo find our way back to Cortina by the Val Buona and the pass of the Tre Croce. This route, if practicable, would take us the complete circuit of the Crota Malcora, and Taleo and Marmarole, and could be done, apparently, nearly all the way by carriage road. A consultation with old Gadina proved that this plan was feasible as far as a place called Casa Sin San Marco in the Val Buena, now accessible by means of one of the new roads in process of construction by the Italian government. As to whether this road was or was not actually completed as far as the Casa di San Marco, he was not quite sure but he did not doubt that the carriage could be got along somehow. Beyond that point, however, the new way had certainly not yet been opened, and we as certainly could only follow it as far as it went. He would therefore send saddle horses round by the Tre Croce Pass to meet us at the Casa di San Marco, the carriage coming back by way of a cart track leading around by Landro. With these saddle horses we could then ride up to the Misserina Alp and return by the Tre Croce to Cortina. As regarded time, we could make our giro in either three days or two, sleeping in the one case at both Pieve de Cadore and Aranzo, or in the other, starting early enough to spend the day at Pieve and reach Aranzo in the evening. Having heard unfavorable reports of the inn at Pieve, we decided on the latter course. The day we started upon this, our first long expedition, was also the day that began Giuseppe's engagement as our traveling attendant. We rose early, having ordered the carriage for 7 a.m., a roomy, well-appointed landau, drawn by a pair of capital horses, and driven by a solemn, shock-headed coachman of imperturbable gravity and civility. The whole turnout, indeed, was surprisingly good and comfortable, and would have done credit to any of the first-class hotels we had lately left behind. The Gadinas assembled in a body to see us off. Els made, mournful enough at being left behind in a strange land, watched us from the balcony. The postmaster, the chemist, the grocer, and the curé stood together in a little knot at the corner of the piazza to see us go by. 
At last, bags, rugs, and umbrellas being all in, Giuseppe jumped up to his seat on the box, the driver cracked his whip, and away we went in the midst of a chorus of buon viaggios from the lookers-on. The first twelve or fourteen miles of road, as far as Tia Cadore, lay over the same ground that we had already traversed the day of our arrival at Cortina. At Tay, however, we turned aside, leaving the Montezuco zigzag far below, and so went up the long white road leading to the hamlet on the hill. About halfway between the two valleys we drew up at a little wayside church, to see a certain miracle-working crucifix said to have been found in the year 1540 in a field close by, where it was turned up accidentally by the plough. Without being, as some local antiquaries would have had it believed, so ancient as either the time of the invasion of the Visigoths in A.D. 410, or that of the Huns in A.D. 432, the crucifix is undoubtedly curious, and may well have been buried for security at the time of the German invasion under Maximilian, in 1508. Since that time it is supposed to have wrought a great number of miracles, to have sweated blood, and so stayed the pestilence of 1630, and in various ways to have extended an extraordinary degree of favor and protection towards the people of Cadore. The little church, originally dedicated to St. Antonio, is now called the Search of the Santismo Crocifexo, and enjoys a high reputation throughout this part of Tyrol. The crucifix is carved in old brown wood, and the sacred image is somewhat ludicrously disfigured by a wig of real hair. We reached Pieve de Cadori at about half-past eleven a.m., delays included, and found the albergo quite as indifferent as its reputation. It was very small, very dirty, and crowded with peasants eating, drinking, and smoking. Going upstairs in search of some corner where we might leave our wraps, and by and by take luncheon apart, we found the bedroom so objectionable that we decided to occupy the landing. It was a comfortless place, crowded with lumber, and only a shade more airy than the rest of the house. A space was cleared, however, a couple of seats were borrowed from a neighboring room, and the top of a great carved cassone, or linen chest, was made to serve for a table. Having ordered some food to be ready by one o'clock, it being now nearly eleven, we then hastened out to see the sights of the place. The landlady's youngest daughter, an officious little girl of about twelve, volunteered as guide, and being rejected, followed us pertinaciously from a distance. The quaint old piazza, with its gloomy arcades, its antique houses with Venetian windows, its cafés, its fountain, and its loungers, is just like the piazzas of Serraval, Longarone, and other provincial towns of the same epoch. With its picturesque prefettura and belfry tower, one is already familiar in the pages of Gilbert's Cadore. There, too, is the fine old double flight of steps leading up to the principal entrance on the first floor, as in the town hall at Helbron, a feature by no means Italian. And there, about midway up the shaft of the campanile, is the great, gaudy, well-remembered fresco, better meant than painted, wherein Titian, some twelve feet in height, this picture, a gift to the commune of Cadore from the artist who painted it, is now the only mural fresco in the town. Some years ago, one of the old houses in the piazza, now ruthlessly whitewashed, is said to have borne distinct traces of external decorations by Cesare Vicellio, the cousin and pupil of Titian. Turning aside from the glowing piazza and following the downward slope of a hill to the left of the prefettura, we come, at the distance of only a few yards, upon another open space, grassy and solitary, surrounded on three sides by rambling, dilapidated-looking houses, and opening on the fourth to a vista of woods and mountains. In the midst of this little piazza stands a massive stone fountain, time-worn and water-worn, surmounted by a statue of St. Tiziano in the robes and square cap of an ecclesiastic. The water, trickling through two metal pipes in the pedestal beneath St. Tiziano's feet, makes a pleasant murmuring, in the old stone basin, while, half hidden behind this fountain, and leaning up as if for shelter against a larger house adjoining, stands a small, whitewashed cottage, upon the side wall of which an incised tablet bears the following record. Nell, 1477, Fra queste umile mura, Tiziano Vesselio, Vene a celebre vita, Donde Yuskova Gia Presso a Sentiani, in Venezia, 
Adi, 17 Agosto, 1576. A poor, mean-looking, low-roofed dwelling, disfigured by external chimney-shafts and a built-out oven, lit with tiny, blinking medieval windows, altogether unlovely, altogether unnoticeable, but the birthplace of Titian. It looked different, no doubt, when he was a boy, and played outside here on the grass. It had probably a high, steep roof, like the homesteads in his own landscape drawings, but the present old brown tiles have been over it long enough to get mottled with yellow lichens. One would like to know if the fountain and the statue were there in his time, and if the water trickled over to the same low tune, and if the woman came there to wash their linen and fill their brazen water-jars, as they do now. This lovely green hill, at all events, sheltered the home from the east winds, and Monte Durano lifted its strange crest yonder against the southern horizon, and the woods dipped down to the valley, then as now, where the bridle path slopes away to join the road to Venice. We went up to the house and knocked. The door was opened by a sickly, hunchbacked lad who begged us to walk in, and who seemed to be quite alone there. The house was very dark, and looked much older inside than from without. A long, low, gloomy upstairs chamber with a huge penthouse fireplace jutting into the room was evidently as old as the days of Titian's grandfather, to whom the house originally belonged, while a very small and very dark adjoining closet, with a porthole of windows sunk in a slope of massive wall, was pointed out as the room in which the great painter was born. "'But how do you know that he was born here?' I asked. The hunchback lifted his wasted hand with a deprecating gesture. "'They have always said so, Signora,' he replied. "'They have said so for more than four hundred years.' "'They?' I repeated doubtfully. "'The Vicelli, Signora.' I had understood that the Vicelio family was extinct. "'Scusate, Signora,' said the hunchback. "'The last direct descendant of El Tiziano died not long ago, a few years before I was born, and the collateral Vicelli are citizens of Cadore to this day. If the Signora will be pleased to look for it, she will see the name of Vicelio over a shop on the right-hand side, as she returns to the piazza.' I did look for it, and there, sure enough, over a small shop window I found it. It gave one an odd sort of shock, as if time were for the moment annihilated, and I remembered how, with something of the same feeling, I once saw the name of Rubens over a shop-front in the market-place at Cologne. I left the house less incredulous than I entered it. Of the identity of the building there has never been any kind of doubt, and I am inclined to accept with the house the identity of the room. Titian, it should be remembered, lived long enough to become, long before he died, the glory of his family. He became rich, he became noble, his fame filled Italy. Hence the room in which he was born may well have acquired, half a century before his death, perhaps even during the lifetime of his mother, that sort of sacredness that is generally of post-mortem growth. The legend, handed down from Vicelio to Vicelio in uninterrupted succession, lays claim, therefore, to a more reliable pedigree than most traditions of a similar character. The large old house adjoining, known in Cadore as the Casa Zampieri, was the next place to be visited. It originally formed part of the Vicelio property, and contains an early fresco, once external but now brought inside by the enlargement of the house, and supposed to have been painted by Titian in his youth. The hunchback offered to conduct us to this house, and, having ushered us out into the little piazza, carefully locked his own door behind him. Here, lying in wait for us, we found the officious small girl with some three or four companions of her own age, who immediately formed themselves into an uninvited bodyguard, and would not be shaken off. End of section 12「Trodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys」Section 13 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. « Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys » and Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites Chapter 5 Cortina to Piève de Cadore Part 4 The hunchback rang the Zampieri bell, but no one answered. 
He knocked, but the echo of his knocking died away, and nothing came of it. At length he tried the door. It was only latched, and it opened instantly. "'Let us go upstairs,' he said, and walked straight in. We followed somewhat reluctantly. The bodyguard trooped in after us. "'This way,' said the hunchback, already halfway up the staircase. "'But the mistress of the house,' we urged, hesitatingly. "'Where is she?' "'Ah, Chilosa. Perhaps she is out. Perhaps we shall find her upstairs.' Again we followed. It was a large house, and had once upon a time been handsomely decorated. The landing was surrounded by doors and furnished with old high-backed chairs, sculptured presses, and antique oak chests big enough for two or three Ginevras to have been hidden in. Our guide opened one of the doors, led us into a bare-looking kind of drawing-room, and did the honors of the place as if it all belonged to him. Echo il Tiziano, he said, pointing to a rough fresco which, though executed on the wall of the room, was set round with a common black and gold framing. The subject, which is very simple, consists only of three figures, a long-haired boy kneeling on one knee, and a seated Madonna, with the Christ-child standing in her lap. These are relieved against a somewhat indefinite background of pillars and drapery. The drawing of this group is not particularly good. The coloring is thin and poor, but there is much dignity and sweetness both in the attitude and expression of the Madonna. The drapery and background have, however, suffered injury at some time or other, and worse still, restoration. A small picture, which the lad originally appeared to be presenting as a votive offering, has been altogether painted out, but its former position is clearly indicated by the attitude of the hands of the two principal figures. According to the same respectable chain of local tradition, Titian painted this fresco at the age of eleven years. Mr. Gilbert, who knows more, and has written more, about Cadore than any of Titian's biographers, suggests that the kneeling boy is a portrait of the young painter by himself, and that he commended himself in this manner to the divine care, before leaving home in 1486, to become a pupil of Zucate at Venice. Meanwhile the hunchback entertained us with the history of the fresco, the bodyguard stood gaping by, and the odious small girl amused herself by peeping into the photographic albums on the table. In the midst of it all, a door was opened at the farther end of the room, and a lady came in. To our immense relief, she seemed to take the invasion as a matter of course, and received us as amiably as if we had presented ourselves under the properest circumstances. It may be that she is in the constant habit of finding stray foreign tourists in forcible possession of her drawing-room, but she certainly betrayed no surprise at sight either of ourselves or our suite. She showed us some old maps and engravings of Cadore, a lithographed head of Titian, and some other worthless treasures, and when we rose to take our leave she asked for our cards. I value them, she said, as souvenirs of the strangers who honor me by a visit. The hunchback now went back to his own home, and we bent our steps toward the Duomo, always persecuted by the irrepressible little girl who, now that the hunchback had withdrawn, constituted herself our guide whether we would or no, and had it all her own way. She chattered, she gesticulated, she laid forcible hands upon the sketching case, she made plunges at our parasols, she skirmished round us and before us and behind us, and kept up a breathless rush of insufferable babble. The signoras were going to the Duomo? Echo! They had but to follow her. She knew the way. She had known it all her life. She was born here. See, that was the prefectura. Would the signoras like to go over the prefectura? Many strangers did go over the prefectura. Yonder was the schoolhouse. She went to school there. She was fond of going to school. Last week she had a tooth out. It hurt dreadfully. Oh, dreadfully. It was pulled out by the medico. He lived in the piazza yonder, nearly opposite the post office. This little house here was the house of Parocco. She had an uncle who was a Parocco, not here, however, at Domeggi up the valley. And she had an aunt at Cortina, and brothers and sisters, lots of brothers and sisters, all older than herself. Her sister had a baby last week. Oh, such a little baby, no longer than that. Would the signoras like to see the baby? Ah, well, here was the church. The signoras must come in by the side door. The great door is always locked, except on saints' days and Sundays. The side door is always open. This way, this way, and please to mind the step. 
It is a large church, quite as large as the Duomo of Saraville, unfinished externally, bare-looking, but well-proportioned within. The chancel and transept are full of pictures, some two or three of which are reputed genuine Titians. None of these, however, though all in the style and of the school of the great master, are so strikingly fine as to declare their parentage at first sight, like the great Titian of Saraval. It happened, fortunately for us, that the Parocco was in the vestry. Hearing strange voices speaking a strange tongue, he came out, a handsome, gentlemanly little man of about forty-seven or fifty, with keen, well-cut features, very bright eyes, a fresh color, and silver-gray hair. He entered at once into conversation, and was evidently well pleased to show the treasures of his church. His name and style are Don Antonio da Villa, Don being probably a corruption of Domine, a Paris priest, and he has for fifteen years been Parocco of this, his native town. In point of taste and education he is superior to the general run of Tyrolean pastors. He takes an eager interest in all that relates to Titian and the Vicelli, and believes Cadore to be the axis on which the world goes round. The Titians in the church are two in number, one a large, life-size painting containing four full-length figures, the other an oblong, also a figure subject, half life-size and half length. The first represents the Madonna and Child, seated, with S. Rocco standing on one side of the group and S. Sebastiano on the other. S. Rocco points as usual to the wound in his thigh. S. Sebastiano stands in the traditional Perugianesque style, with an upturned face, hands bound behind his back, and his body pierced with arrows. The coloring has sadly faded. The saints are not very well drawn. The whole design is poor, the treatment conventional, the quality of the work early, and yet no student of Titian could look at it for five minutes and doubt its authenticity. It is the figure of the seated Madonna that stamps the work with Titian's sign manual. Here is the somewhat broad, calm face, the fresh complexion, the reddish-golden hair that he delighted to paint his whole life long. It was his favorite type of female loveliness, that type which he developed to its ultimate perfection in the gorgeous, sacred, and profane love of the Borghese gallery. Even the draperies of the Cadore Madonna, although the crimson has lost its fire and the blue has gone cold and dim, yet recall those other glowing voluminous folds, so impossible, so magnificent, which marked the highest ideal flight ever attained in mere piegi. The present picture was doubtless executed while Titian was yet a mere lad, but at the same time it bears internal evidence of having been painted after he had seen Venice, and studied the works of the Venetian colorists. Between this painting and the smaller one there reaches a great gulf of time, a gap of perhaps fifty years. The first was the work of his boyhood, the second was the work of his age. He painted it, most likely, and presented it to the church during one of his summer visits to his native hills. It hangs in the Vicelli Chapel, a chapel dedicated to his own patron saint, St. Tiziano, and in that chapel, under the altar, it was his desire to have been finally laid to rest. He died, however, as we all know, in time of plague at Venice, and where he died was, of necessity, buried. This little picture, by which the Cadorini set unbounded store, represents St. Tiziano and St. Andrew adoring the infant Christ, who lies in the lap of the Virgin. Supposed to be a portrait of Titian's nephew, Marco Vecellio, kneels to the left of the spectator, in rich episcopal robes of white and gold brocade. St. Andrew, a portrait of Titian's brother Francesco, crouches reverently on the right. Titian himself, bearing St. Tiziano's crozier, appears in attendance upon the saint, in the corner to the left, while the Virgin Mother, according to popular belief, represents the wife of the painter. The Madonna here is indifferently executed, but the child is brought out into fine relief, and the flesh is well modeled, warm and solid. The great feature of the picture, however, is St. Tiziano, whose handsome, brown, uplifted face, Italian features, rich southern complexion, and rapt devotional expression are in the master's purest style. The white and gold brocade of the saint's episcopal vestments and the subdued gold of his meter reminds one, for their richness and solidity of texture, 
of the handling of Paolo Veronese. The head of Titian by himself in the left corner may be said to date the picture, and represents a man of perhaps sixty years of age. The execution of the whole is very unequal, so unequal as to suggest the idea of its having been partly executed by a scholar. In this case, however, the figures of St. Tiziano and the infant Christ must be unhesitatingly ascribed to the hand of the master. Besides these two pictures, the treasures of Cadore, the church contains several paintings by the brothers and nephews of Titian, amongst others a Last Supper by Cesare Vecellio, a Martyrdom of St. Catherine by Orazio Vecellio, and foremost in merit, as well as in size, four large works in tempura originally painted upon the doors of the organ, by Marco Vecellio, the nephew who sat for the St. Tiziano in the altarpiece already described. These four paintings, said the priest, had been lying for years, neglected and forgotten, in a loft, to which they had been removed when taken down from the front of the organ. It had long been his desire to get them framed and hung in the church, and now, after years of waiting, he had only just been able to carry out his design. "'A Tyrolean pastor has not many lira to spend on the fine arts,' he said, smiling. "'But it is done at last, and the signoras are the first strangers who have seen them. They have not been up longer than three or four days.' These four pictures measured some sixteen feet in height by about eight in breadth, and were mounted in plain wooden frames painted black and varnished. The outside cost of these frames, one would fancy, could scarcely have exceeded twenty lira each, or a little over three pounds, English, for the four. But Don Antonio had cherished his project for years before he was rich enough to realize it. The temperas may be described as four great panels, each panel decorated with a single colossal figure. Of these, St. Matthew and St. Mark make one pair, the angel of the Annunciation and the Virgin the other. With the exception of the Virgin, which is immeasurably inferior to the others, these figures are, far and away, the finest things in Cadore. For largeness of treatment and freedom of drawing, the writer knows nothing with which to compare them, unless it be the cartoons at South Kensington. The angel of the Annunciation, bold, beautiful, buoyant as if just dropped down from heaven, advances on half-bended knee, with an exquisite air of mingled authority and reverence. His head and flying curls are wholly Raphaelesque. So is the grand head and upturned face of St. Mark on one of the other panels, though sadly injured and obliterated. The angel and virgin face each other on either side of the transept, looking west, while St. Matthew and St. Mark occupy the same positions just opposite. The angel, said Don Antonio, was too far separated from the Virgin, but that could not be helped, there being no other place in the church where they could be seen to so much advantage. Having done the honors of the Sangrestia, which contained several very indifferent old pictures, including a doubtful Palmo Vecchio, Don Antonio led the way up a narrow stone staircase to the Vestiario, and there, as an especial favor, permitted us to see some antique embroidered vestments and procession banners that had been in use on great occasion from immemorial time. Much more interesting than these, however, and much more curious, was a very ancient, carved, and gilded predella, or shrine, in the florid Gothic style, surmounted by a dry, Byzantine-looking Christ, and constructed with folding doors below like a triptych. The panels of these doors were decorated outside with four small full-length paintings of the evangelists, in a clear, brilliant, highly finished manner, the heads and general treatment recalling the style of Sandro Botticelli, while inside the shrine contained four richly canopied niches, each occupied by a small carved and painted saint, very naive and medieval, like little simaboos done in wood. This predella belongs to a period long anterior to the Titian epoch, and adorned the high altar up to the beginning of the present century. It was already long past the hour at which we had ordered luncheon, when, having thanked Don Antonio for his courtesy, we again came out into the blinding sunshine. The insufferable little girl had now happily vanished, but she turned up again as soon as we reappeared at the albergo, buzzed about us all the time we were dispatching our uncomfortable midday meal, 
and was only driven off by help of Giuseppe when we went out again presently to sketch and stroll about the town and the castle hill for another couple of hours before pursuing our journey to Aranzo. End of section 13「Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys」Section 14 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys A Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites Chapter 6 Aranzo and Valbuena Part 1 The view of Cadore upon which one looks back from the bend of the road half a mile out of the town on the way to Colazzo, and again from the Ponte della Molina about another mile farther on, is one of the finest of all its kind in all this part of Tyrol. At the same time it has in it very little of the Tyrolean element. Pictorially speaking it is a purely Italian subject, majestic, harmonious, classical, with just sufficient sternness in the mountain forms to give it sublimity but with no outlines abrupt or fantastic enough to disturb the scenic repose of the composition. In the foreground we have the ravine of the Molina spanned by a picturesque old bridge, at the farther end of which a tiny chapel clings to an overhanging ledge of cliff. In the middle distance, seen across an intervening chasm of misty valley, the little faraway town of Cadore glistens on its strange saddleback ridge, watched over as of old by its castle on the higher slope above farthest of all rising magnificently against the clear afternoon sky the fine pyramidal mass of monte Pera closes in the view for light and shadow for composition for all that goes to make up a landscape in the grand style the picture is perfect nothing is wanting not even the foreground group to give its life for here come a couple of bullock trucks across the bridge as primitive and picturesque as if they had driven straight out of the fifteenth century. It is just such a subject as Poussin might have drawn, and Claude have colored. At Domeggi, about three and a half miles from Cadore, we come upon a village almost wholly destroyed a few months back by fire. It is now one mass of black and shapeless ruin, but it will not long remain so, for the whole population, men, women, and little children, swarm like bees about a burnt hive, casting away rubbish, carrying loads of stones, mixing mortar, and helping to rebuild their lost homes. New foundations and new walls are already springing up, and by this present time a second Domeggi has doubtless risen on the ashes of the first. Lozo, the next village, about two miles farther up the valley, was burnt down in just the same way a year or two ago and is now most unpicturesquely new, solid, and comfortable. Perhaps to be burnt out is, on the whole, the best fate that can befall the inhabitants of any of these ancient timber-built hamlets, for their dwellings are then replaced by substantial stone-built houses. As it is, what with danger from fire and danger from bergfalls, the smaller Tyrolean Pacey are by no means safe or pleasant places to live in, and may stand comparison in point of insecurity with Portici, Torre del Greco, or any others of the Vesuvian villages. Now the road, which has been very bad all the way from Cadore, slopes gradually down towards the bed of the torrent, passing within sight of the Lorenzago to the right, and under the impending precipices of Monte Cornon to the left. Mountain and village has each its legend. Lorenzago, picturesquely perched on one of the lower slopes on Monte Credola, claims to be the scene of the martyrdom of St. Florian, a popular Tyrolean saint whose intercession is supposed to be of a special efficacy in cases of fire, while Monte Cornon is said to derive its name from an incident in the history of Cadore thus related by Mr. Gilbert. Along the slopes above this gorge, in the War of 1509, a division of Maximilian's troops was cautiously advancing, when the notes of a horn, corno, broke suddenly from the misty mountainside. It was but a casual herdsman sounding, as is still the custom there at certain seasons, to warn off bears, but supposing themselves to be attacked by the Cadore people, panic seized the invaders, and they then fled the way they came, over the Santa Croce Pass to Sexton. Cadore, page 92. 
The same rustic horn, sounded for the same purpose, may be heard here on quiet autumn evenings to this day, what time the bears come prowling down to rob orchards in the valley, and it is remarkable that there are more bears in the district about Monte Cornon, Comelico, and the Gael Thal than in any other part of the Alps. A little way beyond the village of Lozo, we cross the Piave and continue along the left bank as far as the point of junction with the Anzizi at Trepante, a famous triple bridge consisting of three bold arches, each ninety feet in span and all resting on a single central pier. To the left, winding away between richly wooded heights, lies the valley of Aronzo while to the right the upper Piave, its grey waters shrunken to half their previous volume, come hurrying down a bare and stony channel from its source in the Carnic Alps. And now, having tracked it for many a mile of its long course, since first we saw it widening across the plain near Conegliano, we are to bid a last farewell to the Piave. It was not then very far from its grave in the Adriatic, it is now about as distant from its cradle in the fastness of Monte Peralba. A curious old historical writer, one Dottore Giorgio Piloni of Belluno, who evolved a dull book in a dull style just one hundred and sixty years ago, speaks of the Piave not only as the largest and most important, but also as the most ancient river of the province, and seeks to identify it with the river Anessum, mentioned by Pliny in his chapter on the Venetian territory. He urges, in proof of its antiquity, the depth of its bed and the height of its banks, whereby, he says, it may plainly be proved that this Piave cannot be a new river, as in other instances one sees may happen by intervention of earthquakes and other accidents. The good doctor, when he wrote this, had evidently never visited the scene of the great bergfall in the gorge of Serraval, or seen the basin of the Piave at Capo di Ponte. Taking the right bank of the Anzie, we now enter the Val d'Oronzo. The bad road which began at Cadore ends at Tre Ponte, and once more the horses have a fine, new, broad post-road beneath their feet. The sun by this time is dropping westward, the trees fling long shadows aslant the sloping sward, the gnats come out in clouds, and the air is full of evening scents and sounds. It has been a long day, and nearly twelve hours have gone by since we started from Cortina in the morning. How much longer have we yet to be upon the road before we reach Aranzo? Being asked this question, the driver, whose politeness is such that it never permits him to give a direct answer to anything, touches his hat with his whip-handle, and replies that it is as the signora pleases. Come la piace, signora. But how many kilometers have we yet before us? He coughs apologetically. Kilometers? Con rispetta, it is by no means a question of kilometers. With horses like these, kilometers go for nothing. Ebbene, as a question of time, then, how soon shall we be at Aranzo? In an hour? In an hour and a half? Before dusk? The driver shrugs his shoulders, looks round in a helpless way, as if seeking some means of escape, touches his hat again, and stammers, Come le passi, signora. Come le passi is the formula by which all his ideas are bounded. He has no opinions of his own. He would die rather than express himself with decision about anything. Ask him what you will, the name of a village, the hour of the day, the state of the weather, his own name, age, and birthplace, and he will inevitably reply, Come le paci. It is his invariable answer, and the effort to extract any other from him is sheer waste of breath. The distance, however, proves to be only four miles. In about half an hour from the Treponti we come to a bend in the road, and lo, there lies a large, rambling village, straggling along near the bank of the Anzier, a big mosque-like church with a glittering white dome, an older-looking campanile peering above the brown roofs at the farther extremity of the place, and beyond all these a vista of valley threaded by a deep, dark torrent fringed with sullen pine woods. It is not the village of Aranzo, however, it is not the valley, nor the torrent, nor the pine woods that make the beauty and wonder of the view. 
It is the encircling array of mountain summits standing up rank above rank, peak beyond peak against the clear, pale evening sky. Farthest and strangest, at the remote end of the valley, rise the Dre Zinnen, now showing distinctly as three separate obelisks. A soft haze through which the sun is setting hangs over the distance, and the Dre Zinnen, belted by luminous bands of filmy horizontal cloud, look like icebergs afloat in a sea of golden mist. It is one of those rare and radiant effects that one may travel for a whole summer without seeing, and which, when they do occur, last but a few moments. Before we had reached the first cottages the golden light was gone, and the vapors had turned gray and ghostly. Aranzo is divided into an upper and a lower village, known respectively as the Villa Grande and the Villa Piccola. Villa Piccola, which one reaches first on entering from the Treponti side, is a modern suburb to Villa Grande. The houses of this modern suburb are large and substantial, reminding one of the houses at Ober Ammergau, and some are decorated in the same way with rough religious frescoes. To Villa Piccola belong both the large new church and the dome, and the albergo, a clean-looking house lying a little way back from the road on the left hand, close against the parsonage. Driving up to this inn we find some four or five chaises and caratini drawn up in front of the house, a knot of men and women gathered round the door, faces of other men and women looking out from the upper windows, and an unwanted air of bustle and festivity about the place. The landlady, a hard-featured dame in rusty black, standing at the door with her arms akimbo, shakes her head as we draw up, and does not give Giuseppe time to speak. She cannot take us in, not she, couldn't take the King of Italy if he came this evening. Impossible. She has a wedding party from Comolico, and her house is quite full. Echo, there is another albergo higher up in Villa Grande. We shall probably find room there. If not, well, she can't say. She supposes we must go back the way we came. Giuseppe and the driver look blank. They mutter something in low voices about l'altro albergo, and my ear detects an ominous emphasis on the l'altro. The landlady purses up her mouth, the travellers in possession, in all their gayest holiday clothes, survey us with an insolent air of triumph. The coachman gathers up his reins, and we drive on, quite discomfited. With the scattered homesteads of Villa Piccola, the good road ends abruptly, and becomes a mere stony cart-track full of ruts and rubble. Then, all at once, we find ourselves in the midst of a foul, closely packed labyrinth of old timber houses, ruinous, smoke-blackened, dilapidated, compared with which the meanest villages we have as yet passed through are clean and promising. Here squalid children shout and sprawl and beg. Slatternly women lean from upper windows, and sullen, fierce-looking men lounging in filthy doorways stare in a grim, unfriendly way as the carriage lurches past. This is Villa Grande. Another moment, and turning a sharp corner, we draw up before a bare, desolate-looking house standing a little apart from the rest, with a walled-off bowling ground on one side, in which some six or eight men are playing at ball, and a score or two of others looking on. This is our albergo. We look at Giuseppe, at the house, at each other. Is there no other place to which we can go for the night? we ask, aghast. Giuseppe shakes his head. This and the inn at Villa Piccola are the only two in the place. If we do not stay here, we have no resource but to go back to Tea Cadore, a distance of at least fourteen, if not fifteen, English miles. At this crisis, out comes a tall, smiling, ungainly woman, with an honest face and a mouth full of large, shining teeth, an anxious, willing, cheerful body, eager to bid us welcome, eager to carry any number of bags and rugs, brimming over with good will and civility. She leads the way up an extremely dirty flight of stairs, across a still dirtier loft full of flour sacks, cheeses, and farming implements, and thence up a kind of step-ladder that leads to a landing furnished with the usual table and chairs, linen press, and glass cupboard. Opening off this landing are some two or three very bare but quite irreproachable bedrooms with low, whitewashed walls and ceilings about seven feet from the ground. 
The floors, the bedding, the rushed-bottomed chairs, are all as scrupulously clean as the lower part of the establishment is unscrupulously the reverse. Carpets and curtains, of course, there are none. What is wanting in personal comforts is made up for, however, in the way of spiritual adornments. The walls are covered with prints of saints and martyrs in little black frames, while over the head of each bed there hangs a colored lithograph of the Madonna, displaying a plump pink heart stuck full of daggers, and looking wonderfully like a valentine. Here, then, we may take up our quarters and be at peace, and here, upon the landing, we are presently served with hot cutlets, coffee, eggs, and salad, all of very tolerable quality. While this meal is in preparation, we watch the players in the bowling-ground. Our driver, having attended to his horses, strips off his coat and joins in the game. Giuseppe smokes his cigar and looks gravely on. By and by the dusk closes round, the players disperse, and we, who have to be upon the road again by 8.30 a.m., are glad to go to rest, watched over by our respective Madonnas. Whether seen by evening gray or morning sunshine, the upper village of Aranzo is as unprepossessing, disreputable-looking a place as one would care to become acquainted with, either at home or abroad. Rambling about next morning before breakfast, I saw nothing but dirt and poverty under their least picturesque aspect. The people looked sullen, scowling, and dissolute, and the houses overcrowded, the surrounding country not half cultivated. I afterwards learned that the commune was poor, in debt, and overpopulated, and that the inhabitants bore an indifferent reputation. It was pleasant enough, at all events, to drive off again in the cool, bright morning, our horses' heads turned once again toward the hills. And now, Aronzo being left behind, the scenery becomes grander with each mile of the way. Every opening gorge to right and left discloses fresh peaks and glimpses of new horizons. The pine slopes, last evening so gloomy, are outlined in sunshine this morning, and the torrent ripples along its bed of glittering white pebbles, like a blue ribbon with a silver border. The valley from this point looks like a cul-de-sac. The road runs up to the foot of a great barrier of stony debris at the base of Monte Giralba on the one side, and there, to all appearances, ends abruptly. Monte Rosiana, locally known as Monte Ruggiana, puts forth a gigantic buttress on the other, while the cull and yellow, a wild pile of peaks, not far short of ten thousand feet in height, rises an impassable barricade between the two. It is not till one has driven quite up to this point that the valley, instead of being hopelessly blocked, is found to turn off sharply to the left, narrowing to a mere gorge and winding round the western flank of Monte Rosiana. End of section 14「peaks and unfrequented valleys」section 15. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys A Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites by Amelia B. Edwards Chapter 6 Aronzo and Valbuona Part 2 now, some little distance farther on, we pass the desolate hamlet of Trevisea, a cluster of half-ruined cottages at the mouth of a wild glen, leading to a perilous and rarely trodden pass behind the coal and yellow. And now the road plunges all at once into a dense, fragrant tract of pine forest, musical with the singing of birds, pierced here and there by shafts of quivering sunlight and all alive with little brown squirrels darting to and fro among the pendant fir-cones. By and by a great cloven peak comes up above the tree-tops to the left, shutting out half the sunshine, and then a broad glade opens suddenly in the wood, revealing what looks at first like a range of new and colossal mountains, the lower spurs of which are only separated from us by the bed of the Anzier. At this point the driver pulls up, and half turning round upon his box, says with all the exaggerated politeness of a master of the ceremonies in a provincial assembly room, Con rispetta, signora, il marmarole. Being thus formally introduced to our new Dolomite, 
we would fain achieve a better view of it than is possible from this point. All we see of it, indeed, is a vast mass towering up indefinitely beyond the pine forest, and facing us a huge slope of reddish-brown earth piled up to a height of some five or seven hundred feet against the mountain. This slope of rubble, dotted over here and there with wooden sheds, marks the site of an extensive lead and silver mine, now abandoned, and a tiny hole in the face of the cliff above, no bigger, apparently, than a keyhole, is pointed out as the entrance to the principal shaft. So we go on, always in the green shade of the forest, till we come to a little group of cottages known collectively as the Casa di San Marco, a name recalling the old days of Venetian sovereignty, and still marking the frontier between Italy and Austria. Here, there being no officials anywhere about, we passed unquestioned under the black and yellow pole, and so arrive in a few moments at the opening point of the new government road, which old Gadina had given us directions to follow as far as it went. This new government road, carried boldly up and through a steep hillside of pine forest, is considered, and no doubt with justice, to be an excellent piece of work, but old Holborn Hill, with all the paving stones up, would have been as easy driving compared with it. As yet, indeed, it is not a bad road, but a rough clearing some twenty feet in width, full of stones and rubble and slags of knotted root, with the lately felled pine trunks lying prostrate at each side, like the ranks of slain upon a battlefield. No vehicle, it seems, has yet been brought this way, and though we all alight instantly, it seems doubtful whether the carriage can ever be got up. The horses, half maddened by clouds of gadflies, struggle up the rugged slope, stopping every now and then to plunge and kick furiously. The landau rocks and rolls like a ship at sea. Every moment the road becomes worse, and the blaze of noonday heat more intolerable. Presently we come upon a gang of road-makers some two hundred in number, women and children as well as men, swarming over the banks like ants, clearing, leveling, and stone-breaking. They pause in their work, and stare at us as if we were creatures from another world. "'You are the first travellers who have come up this way,' says the overseer, as we pass by. "'You must be Inglesi. At length we reach a point where the road ceases altogether, its future course being marked off with stakes across a broad plateau of smooth turf. This plateau, a kind of natural arena in the midst of an upper world of pine forest, is hemmed in closely by trees on three sides, but sinks away on the left to a wooded dell down which a clear stream leaps and sparkles. We look around, seeing no outlet save by the way we have come, and wondering what next can be done with the carriage. To our amazement the driver coolly takes the leader by the head and makes straight for the steep pitch dipping down to the torrent. "'You will not attempt to take the carriage down into that hole!' exclaims the rider. "'Con respeta, signora, there is no other way,' replies the driver, deferentially. "'But the horses will break their legs, and the carriage will be dashed to pieces.' "'Come la piace, signora,' says the driver, dimly recognizing the truth of this statement. "'We are standing now on the brink of the hollow, the broken bank shelving down to a depth of about thirty feet, the torrent tumbling and splashing at the bottom, and the opposite bank rising almost as abruptly beyond.' "'Are we bound to get it across here?' I ask. "'Con rispetta, yes, signora. That is to say, it can be sent back to the Cortina all the way round by Aronzo and the Pieve de Cadore. It is as the signora pleases. Now it pleases neither of the signoras to send the carriage back by round of something like forty-five miles. So, after a hurried consultation, we decide to have the horses taken out, and the carriage hauled across by men.' Giuseppe is thereupon dispatched for a reinforcement of navies, and thus, by the help of some three or four stalwart fellows, the landau is lifted bodily over, the horses are led across and re-harnessed, and after a little more pushing and pulling, a rough cart-track on the other side of this Rubicon is gained in safety. Yet a few yards farther, and we emerge upon another space of grassy alp a green, smooth, sloping amphitheatre of perhaps some eighty acres in extent, to the east all woods, to the west all mountains, with one lonely little white house nestling against the verge of the forest a quarter of a mile away. This amphitheatre is the Valbuona, 
That little white house is the cottage of Bastian, the wood ranger. Yonder pale gigantic pinnacles towering in solitary splendor above the tree-tops to the rear of the cottage are the crests of the Cristallo. But above all else, it is the view to the westward that we have come here to see, the famous cirque of the Crota Malcora. And in truth, although we have already beheld much that is wild and wonderful in the world of Dolomite, we have as yet seen nothing that may compare with this. The green sward slopes away from before our feet and vanishes in a chasm of wooded valley of unknown depth and distance while beyond and above this valley, reaching far away out of sight to right and left, piled up precipice above precipice, peak above peak, seamed with horizontal bars of snowdrift, upholding here a fold of glittering glacier, dropping there a thread of misty waterfall, cutting the skyline with all unimaginable forms of jagged ridge and battlement, and reaching, as it seems, midway from earth to heaven, runs a vast, unbroken chain of giant mountains. But what mountains? Familiar as we have become by this time with the Ampeso Dolomites, there is not here one outline that either can recognize. Where, then, are we? And what should we see if we could climb yonder mighty barrier? It takes some minutes' consideration and the help of the map to solve these questions. Then suddenly all becomes clear. We are behind the Crota Malcora, directly behind Sorapis, and looking straight across in the direction of the Pelmo, which, however, is hidden by intervening mountains. The Antileo should be visible to the left, but is blocked out by the long and lofty range of the Marmarole. Somewhere away to the right, in the gap that separates this great panorama from the nearer masses of the Cristallo, lies the Tre Croce Pass leading to Cortina. The main feature of the view, however, is the Crota Malcora, and we are looking at it from the back. Seen on this side, it shows a sheer wall of impending precipice, too steep and straight to afford any resting places for the snow, save here and there upon a narrow ledge or shelf, scarce wide enough for a chamoise. On the Impezzo side, however, it flings out huge piers of rock, so that the westward and eastward faces of it are as unlike as though they belong to two separate mountains. This form, as I by and by discover, is of frequent occurrence in dolomite structure, the civita affording perhaps the most remarkable case in point. Having looked a while at this wonderful view, we are glad once more to escape out of the blinding sunshine into the shade of the pine woods. Here, by the help of rugs and cloaks, we make a tent in which to rest for a couple of hours during the great heat of the day, and so, taking luncheon, studying our books and maps, listening to the bees among the wild flowers, and to the thrushes in the rustling boughs overhead, we fancy ourselves in Arcadia, or the forest of Arden. Meanwhile the woodman's is busy among the fir trees on the hillside, and now and then we hear the crash of a falling tree. The forester who lives in the white cottage yonder comes by and by to pay his respects to the signore. His name is Bastian, and he turns out to be a brother of Santo Sorpas. He also has been a soldier, and is glad now and then when opportunity offers to act as a guide. He lives in this lost corner of the world the whole year round. It is molto tristo, he says, especially in winter. When autumn wanes, he provisions his little house as if for a long siege, laying in a store of flour, cheese, sausage, coffee, and the like. Then the snow comes, and for months no living soul ventures up from the valleys. All is white and silent, like death. The snow is as high as himself, sometimes higher, and he has to dig a trench about the house, that the light may not be blocked out of the lower windows. There was one winter, he says, not many years ago, when the falls were so sudden and so heavy, that he never went to bed at night without wondering whether he should be buried alive in his cottage before morning. While he is yet speaking, a band of road-makers comes trooping by, whistling, laughing, and humming scraps of songs. They are going back to work, having just eaten their midday mess of polenta, and their hearts are glad with wine the rough red wine that Bastian sells at the cottage for about three kreutzers the litro, and which we at luncheon found quite undrinkable. 
The place is full of life now, at all events, says L. consolingly. He looks after them and shakes his head. Yes, signora, he replies, but their work here will soon be done, and then it will seem more solitary than ever. The man is very like Santo, but has nothing of Santo's animation. The lonely life seems to have taken all that brightness out of him. His manner is sad and subdued, and when he is not speaking he has just that sort of lost look that one sees in the faces of prisoners who have been a long time in confinement. At two o'clock we break up our camp and prepare to start again. The polite driver, mindful of a possible bueno mano, comes to take leave, and is succeeded by the lad Giovanni, who has journeyed up from Cortina to meet with us the promised saddle-horses. And now our old friend, the tall chestnut, appears upon the scene with the Peze side-saddle on his back, followed by an equally big black horse with the Gadina saddle, whereupon, having Giuseppe and Giovanni in attendance, we mount and ride away, not without certain shrewd suspicions that our gallant steeds are carrying ladies for the first time. Big as they are, they climb, however, like cats, clambering in a wonderful way up the steep and stony slope of fir forest that rises behind Bastion's cottage and leads to the Missourina out beyond. Three-quarters of an hour of this rough work brings us to a higher level than we have yet reached, and lands us on an immense plateau of rich turf, hemmed in on both sides by an avenue of rocky summits. Those to the right are the Cime Cadino, or Cadine Svitsen. Those on the left are the lower crags of the Cristallo Mass, above which, though unseen from here, towers the gigantic Piz Popina. And this vast prairie valley, so high, so solitary, all greenest grass below, all bluest sky above, undulating away into measureless distance, is the Miserina Alp. As much, perhaps, as a thousand head of cattle are here feeding in the rich pastures. Presently we pass the Stabilimento, or Vacherie, as it would be called in France, a cluster of substantial wooden buildings where the herdsmen live in summer, making and storing the cheeses, which form so important an item in the wealth of the district. At length, when we have journeyed on and on for what seems like an interminable distance, we come upon a circular hollow in the midst of which nestles the Misserina Lake, a green, transparent, tranquil town, fed as we are told by thirty springs, and rich in salmon trout and otters. The place is inconceivably still, beautiful, and solitary. Dark rushes fringe the borders of the lake, and are doubled by reflection. Three cows stand drowsing in the water, motionless. Not a ripple disturbs its glossy surface. Not a sound stirs the air. Yonder, where the vista opens northwards, appear the cloudy summits of the Drezinen. Here, where the glassy lawn slopes down to the water's edge, the very sunshine seems asleep. The whole scene has a breathless unreality about it, as if it were a mirage or a picture. Having rested here a while, we retrace our steps the whole length of the plateau, and then, dismounting, strike across on foot over a long slope of bog and rock, till we gain the mule track leading by the Tre Croce Pass to Cortina. An easy ascent winding up and around the edge of a pine forest now carries us over the shoulder of the Cristallo, which here assumes quite a new aspect, and instead of appearing as one united mass, divides into three enormous blocks, each block in itself a mountain. For a long way the eastward view still commands the range of the Marmarole and the Circa Malcora. Then by degrees, as we work round towards the west, the Marmarole is gradually lost to sight, and the Malcora crags begin to show themselves in profile. At last the summit of the pass is gained, with its three crosses, and all the familiar peaks of the Ampeso side rise once more in magnificent array against the sunset. To the left, the Pelmo and Rochetta, to the right a corner of Monte Lagazui and the three summits of the Tofana. Straight ahead the Bec di Mazzari, Monte Nuvalau, and beyond the gap of the Tresassi Pass, the far-off snow slope of the Marmolata. The road from there to Cortina, though not steep, is long and rough, so rough that we are glad to dismount presently and finish the homeward journey on foot. 
As we go down, a number of wayside crosses, some crudely fashioned in wood, some of rusty iron, attract our attention by their frequency on either side of the path. They are monuments to the memory of travelers lost in the sudden snowstorms that make these passes so perilous in winter time and spring. End of section 15. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys, Section 16. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys, A Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites, by Amelia B. Edwards. Chapter 7 Capriel, Part 1. The time at length came when we must bid good bye to Cortina. It was a place in which many more days might have been spent with pleasure and profit. The walks were endless, the sketching was endless, the climate perfect. Still we had already overstayed the time originally set apart in our program for the Ampeso district. We had made all the most accessible excursions about the neighborhood, and with the whole of that great Italian dolomite center that lies beyond the Tresassi ridge yet unexplored, it was plain that we could ill afford to linger longer on the Austrian border. At the same time, Cortina, just because it lies upon the border, is in danger of being too hastily dismissed by travelers coming in from the Conegliano side. Marvelous as its surrounding mountains are, a stranger is apt to conclude that they but open the way to still greater marvels, and to regard the Ampezzo Thal as only the threshold of Wonderland. Even Mr. Gilbert, visiting Cortina for the first time in 1861, as he himself tells, stayed only one night there, and never ceased to regret the omission till another Tyrolean tour enabled him to repair it. For myself, looking back in memory across that intervening sea of peaks and passes which lies between Botzen and Cortina, I am inclined to place the Ampezzo Dolomites in the very first rank, both as regards position and structure. The mountains of Primiero are more extravagantly wild in outline, the Marmolata carries more ice and snow, the Civita is more beautiful, the solitary giants of the Caesar Alp are more imposing, but taken as a group I know nothing, whether for size, variety, or picturesqueness, to equal that great circle which, within a radius of less than twelve miles from the doors of the Aquila Nera, includes the Pelmo, Antileo, Marmarole, Crota Malcora, Cristallo, and Tofana. It was time, however, as I have said, for us to be moving onward. A practiced mountaineer would doubtless find more than enough employment for a whole season within this one area. But we, who were not mountaineers in any sense of the word, had now done our duty very fairly by the place, and so, not without reluctance, were bound to seek fresh woods and pastures new. Nothing, in short, could have been pleasanter than staying, except going. Our next point being Capriel, it was arranged that we should ride over the Tresassi Pass and send the luggage by Caretta. Giuseppe, always economical, proposed a second Caretta for the Signoras, adding that the char road was a little rough on the side of Capriel. We, however, had already found it more than a little rough on the side of Cortona, and, being impressed with a lively recollection of the horrors of that drive, declined to pursue the experiment any farther. Also, it was necessary to make sure of getting a side-saddle. By taking horses and riding over the pass, we should at least get it as far as Capriel. Possession, so far, would be something gained. I am bound to confess that beyond that point our intentions, though vague, were decidedly felonious. The morning was exquisite when we started. The caretta went first, driven by our polite friend of the other day, and we followed about half an hour later. The procession consisted of two riding horses, Fuchs the chestnut and Moro the black, a mule for the maid, the two elder Gedinas, Giuseppe and Giovanni. The Gedinas were there to lead the horses when necessary, and to bring them home to-morrow, while Giovanni, inasmuch as the mule's present rider had never before mounted anything more spirited than a Sorrento donkey, had strict orders to stay by that animal's head, 
and never to leave his post for an instant. And, indeed, a less inexperienced rider might well have been excused a shade of nervousness, for the road was often steep, and often skirted the brink of very unpleasant-looking precipices, while the promised Basta, destitute alike of rail and pommel, proved to be neither more nor less than a bundle of cushions and sheepskins, strapped upon a man's saddle, with no real support save a stirrup. In this order, then, we finally started, taking our former route in the direction of Falsgarego, and casting many a backward glance at the mountains we were leaving behind us. Arrived once more at the little hospice, the Signora Cuoca was welcomed with acclamations. Again leaving the public room for the use of the Padrona's bright little kitchen, again the eggs and butter, the glittering brass pan, the long brass ladle and the big apron were produced, and again the author covered herself with glory. It may have been the peculiar quality of the air on this particular pass, or it may have been the result of an exaggerated degree of self-approbation. But those Fowles Garego eggs did certainly seem, on both occasions, to transcend in delicacy and richness of flavor all other eggs with which the present writer had ever had the pleasure of becoming acquainted. It was our destiny to be overtaken by rain and mist on the Tresasi. Before we left the hospice, a few uncertain drops were already beginning to fall, and by the time we reached the summit, the marmalata was gleaming in the same ghostly way as before, through fast-gathering vapors. From this point all is new. Skirting first the base of Monte Lagosi, then of the abrupt crag locally known as the Sasso d'Istria, we pass close above some large, unmelted snowdrifts, and so down into a steep, romantic glen traversed by a clear torrent, musical with many a fall, and crossed every here and there by a narrow bridge of roughly hewn pine trunks. Sometimes, where there is no bridge, the water sparkles all across the path, and those on foot have to spring from stone to stone as best they may. Dark firs and larches, growing thicker and closer as the dell dips deeper, make a green gloom overhead. Ferns, mosses, and wild flowers grow in lush luxuriance all over the steep banks, and carpet every hollow. Gaunt peaks are seen now and then through openings in the boughs, as if suspended high up in the misty air. And ever the descending path winds in and out among huge boulders covered with bushes and many-colored lichens. And now as we go on the sky darkens more and more. Then a light, steady mist begins to fall. The mist turns to rain, the rain becomes a storm, and the mountains echo back a long low peal of distant thunder. Meanwhile the road has become very steep and slippery, and the horses keep their feet with difficulty. Then the glen turns and widens, and Castel d'Andraz, a shattered, blank-eyed ruin perched high upon a pedestal of crag, comes suddenly into sight. Steep precipices skirt the ruin on one side, and upland pastures on the other. A green valley opens away beyond, and the grassy slope beside the bridle path is full of large, wild orange lilies and crimson dog roses that flame like jewels in a ray of sunshine, which breaks at this moment through the clouds. Not even the sheets of rain, still pelting pitilessly down, can blot out the wonderful beauty of the view, or reconcile me to the impossibility of stopping then and there to sketch it. We ride on, however, for fully three-quarters of an hour more, stumbling over wet stones and sliding down steps hewn in the solid rock, till at length the little hamlet of Andres, half hidden among trees and precipices, and framed in overhead by a magnificent fragment of rainbow, appears in welcome proximity close beneath our feet. Another turn of the road, and we are there. The men are wet through, the horses are streaming, the rain runs in rivers off our waterproof cloaks, our umbrellas are portable gargoyles. In this state we alight at the door of Finazer's tiny hostelry and Bireria, a very small, clean, humble place, where, having taken off our wettest outer garments and dried ourselves thoroughly at a blazing kitchen fire, we order hot coffee and prepare to make the best of our position till the sky clears again. Never was there such a toy parlor 
as that into which we are ushered on coming out of the kitchen. It is all pine wood, new, bright, fragrant, cinnamon-colored pine wood, shining like gold. Walls, floor, ceiling are all alike, and it is perfectly square, too, in every way, like a beautiful new box of Sorrento or Tunbridge ware. You might have turned it up endwise, or sidewise, or topsy-turvy, and but for the altered position of the door, I would defy the most sagacious architect to find out the difference. Then the chairs, the tables, the corner cupboards, the clock case, all are of the same material. Everything in that room, in short, is pine wood, except the grate. There are certain toy stalls in the Soho Bazaar where, at the cost of a few shillings, one may at any time buy just such wooden furniture in miniature. By and by the rain ceases, the clouds part, the sun breaks out, the horses are brought round, and for the third time that day we again push on for Caprile. And now, not far below this point, the valley of the Cordeval, the fairest and most sylvan we have yet seen, a valley less Italian in character than the Val d'Aranzo, more Swiss than the Ampezzo Thau, rich in corn, maize, hemp, flax, and pasture, and bounded in the far distance by great shadowy mountains patched and streaked with snow, about whose flanks rent storm clouds drift and gather, like the waves of an angry sea. That one of these is the Boe, which we come to know hereafter as a bastion of the Sella Plateau, and that another is the Monte Padon, are facts to be taken for the present upon trust. The Marmolata is also dimly traceable now and then, and presently a blurred, gigantic mass, so enveloped in mist as to show no definite outline of any kind, is pointed out as the Civita. Meanwhile the bridle path, carried at an immense height along the shoulder of Monte Frisolade, follows every curve of the mountain, now commanding the valley of Livinilungo to the northwest, now coming in sight of a corner of the blue lake beyond Caprile to the south, now winding along the face of an almost vertical precipice, now skirting the borders of a pine forest, now striking across a slope of greenest pasture, and at every turn disclosing some new vista more beautiful than the last. Tiny villages, some a thousand feet below, some a thousand feet above the level of our path, are scattered far and wide, each with its little white church and picturesque campanile. Sometimes one, sometimes another of these, stands out for a few moments in brilliant sunshine. Then, as the clouds drive by, sinks away again into shadow. These vivid, alternating passages of light and shade, followed by the intense gloom of another gathering storm, now coming rapidly up from the valleys behind the Marmolata, altogether defy description. And now, anxious if possible to escape another drenching, we hurry on, stared at by all who meet us as if no such cavalcade had ever before found its way along this mountain track. Passing presently through the little village of Colaz, we attract the whole population to their doors and windows, and two very old priests, standing by the church door, pull off their hats and bow to the ground as we ride by. End of section 16